Good morning. It's lovely to see so many smiling faces and a nice sunny Sunday morning. Um, just want to clarify, earlier on when I was clicking my finger, I wasn't do that, doing that to make you all be quiet. <laughs> it's just we have a wee technical issue upstairs, so we need to do it to make sure the sound matches with the video. Anyway, for those of you um, who may not know me, my name is Margaret McBain. I'm one of the elders here at MPN. And yes, last week, Alan, who led the service, is my husband. Okay, just for full disclosure. So welcome to our time of worship together. Whether you're a regular, a visitor, or here for the first time, or watching us online, all are welcome in God's house. So I have a couple of small intimations this morning. Um, first of all, if you haven't already seen these at the front, or there are some on the organ, these are to allow you to choose your favourite hymn. So if there's a piece of praise that you love to sing during worship, and it has a special meaning for you, if you want to fill in one of these wee forms and leave them where? David will take them. I'm just thinking, I've been told where they are, where you can pick them up, but where do we give them? Yeah, so if you give them to David at any point, and David will try and incorporate those hymns or songs of praise into some of the forthcoming services. Okay. Um, we have communion coming up on Sunday, the 26th of June. And anyone who loves our Lord is welcome to take part in this communion time. Tea and coffee will be served as usual after the service round in the main hall. Unfortunately, if you're going out the back door, it does mean you have to walk all the way around the church and down this side. But please join us if you can. If that's too far, go out the front door. Front door can be open, it's not an issue. Billy Graham once said, the purpose of this Christian society called the church is first to glorify God by our worship. We do not go to church just to hear a sermon. We go to church to worship God. So let us worship our loving Heavenly Father in the singing of two songs this morning, starting with 10,000 Reasons, followed by You Are Beautiful.
present Lord. Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we sing praises of adoration, we listen to biblical teaching, we pray, and yet, why do we keep sinning? Why have we not shown ourselves to be true, true disciples this week? Why do we deny you by our actions and our words? Should we give up? And so our list continues. Our unclean hearts, Lord, are ready to be drained of self-pity, doubt, sin and denial by our actions and our words. So today we confess our sins. We acknowledge and reconfirm that we truly love you, Lord. 
Help us to continue to war- forward, to trust, serve and obey, and be able to stand strong in your grace. We thank you that since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with you, Lord, through Jesus Christ. No matter how great our failure, we thank you, Jesus, that you are ready to forgive us and receive us back as one of your children. How truly blessed we are. Amen. Thank you, Jan. Now we have Erland who's going to give us talk one. I was going to say children, but there's no children here, I don't think. No, that's fine. That's all right. Morning. Morning. So I'm going to need three volunteers. And since there's no children here, that means that I'm going to have to use big children. So I'm looking for three volunteers to come and join me. Yes, Jan, thank you so much. I knew I could count on you. And if you don't volunteer soon, I will just pick you out. So that's Mark fine. Is sitting here. Come on, Carrie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come on, Margaret. Come on down. Oh, there's Jeanette. Please, 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 please. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we're going to play play your cards right. Da 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 uh, you can ask the audience for help. You might, you might want to ask the audience for help. And there's nothing in this game for two of the same. All righty. Thank you. That's right, you. Okay. So, Jan, you're my first player. Great. All righty. I'd like you to pop the first card up for me, which is there. It's the three of clubs, and I'd like you to guess higher or lower. Please ask the audience. Well, what do you think, Higher guys? or lower? Higher. 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 Let's see, please. Yay. Yay. Okay. Higher or lower than a king? Lower, 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 lower. Let's see. Yay! Okay, oh, medals for diddles. What do you win? Oh, well, I know I normally bring chocolate, but today. Right, okay. <laughs> All right, so okay. So, higher or lower than a six, please, John? Oh, what do you think? Up the top? Higher, higher, higher. Right, Russell, higher. Oh. oh. It's a three. I'm sorry, John. You're out. Thank you for your participation. Great. Thank you. Carrie, it's your turn. Now, Sandy, if we skip through that one, there'll be another play your card right. There we go. And then we'll start the game from there. So, higher or lower than a jack? Higher, higher. <laughs> lower. Lower. Okie dokie. Oh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid there's nothing in this game for two of the same. Right, round of applause for Carrie. Thank you. Jeanette, okay, are you ready? No. Okay. It's the two of spades. Higher or lower? Higher. Higher. It's the king of clubs. Higher or lower? Lower. It's the three of hearts. Oh. Higher. And it's the Jack of Diamonds, higher or lower? Higher. Higher. Are you sure? Say lower. <laughs> Let's go lower. Yay! Congratulations to the winner, but unfortunately there is no prize today. But thank you for taking part. Great. Can I have the next slide, please, Sandy? When we played Play Your Cards right there, we kind of trusted in our friends to help us out. And trust is what we're talking about today. And Jan mentioned trust in our uh, poem, uh, prayer, poem, prayer, sorry. Thank you, Sandy. And our reading today is from John. It's chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. It's a bit small there, but it tells the story of Jesus appearing to his friends when they were fishing. They were out trying to catch as many fish as they could, and there was nothing there. And Jesus appeared to them and said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will catch some fish. When we were playing Play Your Cards Right, we trusted our friends 
And when Jesus' friends were fishing, they trusted Jesus. And that's what we have to do. Because our friends are great and we rely on them for their knowledge and their experience. And we, we know that people have seen play your cards right before and we know the rules of the game. And if there had been children here, we would have really helped them out today. And that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus helps us out when we need that help. And then when you have Jesus in your life, you're all a winner. So trust in Jesus. Accept that Jesus died for our sin. Believe in Jesus and ask Jesus to help you. And as I've said, the next time you're playing play your cards right, you're guaranteed to win, just like Jeanette was. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Erland. It's always very entertaining when Erland comes up and does talk one for us. Um, We will continue our time of worship together in singing the hymn, We Are the Church. No, that's... is going to lead us in the reading of the gospel. Good morning. And the reading, as we've heard, is from John 21, verses 1 to 17. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. 
Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Amen. Thank you, Maureen. And we will now continue in our time of praise, singing What a Beautiful Name. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. 
We continue as we have sung for our needy selves and our needy world. Where there is discord in our nation and beyond, help us to be the light and healing. As Jesus was bold and confident in reaching out to others in need, help your church to shine, to be healing hands and voices. For those who are hurt and grieving, help us to bring comfort and hope, friendship and peace. For those suffering in poverty, whether in this land or beyond, open our hearts to everything in our power to make a difference. Where there is division within the church and between churches, humble us so that we might seek reconciliation and peace. For all present in this place who need a touch of grace from Jesus, draw us to him in confidence. For those situations in the world today where only you can make a difference, help us to act in powerful ways. And all this, and in the unspoken words of our hearts and minds, we offer in faith and expectation, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Thank you, Ross. And now let's lift our hearts and voices in singing to God be the glory.
David chose the praise for today's service, and unknown to him, that was one of my favourite hymns. That transported me back to Keswick when I was a young 17-year-old, young Christian, and just wonderful times. Thank you, David. You couldn't have chosen better for today. Thank you. So after last week's service, you might not believe this, but Alan and I really didn't plan our talks together. You know, we live in the same house, but, you know, that's sometimes as much as far as it goes. <laughs> I know you heard it, Alan, yep. <laughs> but this morning I'm also looking at a question that Jesus asked, but it's not from the series that Alan was talking about. But before we get to that question, how many of you enjoy going to the beach? Me. Yeah, quite a lot of us. When I'm on holiday, if I'm anywhere near a coast or a lake... I like to go, and if I don't get to swim, I at least want to paddle in the water. I'm trying to tick off as many seas, oceans, and lakes, and therefore beaches, as I can. Living in Presswick, I sometimes take for granted the lovely beach on my doorstep. But did you know that beaches appear, or are inferred, quite a lot in the Bible? For example, Jesus called some of his disciples from their jobs as fishermen, while they were preparing their nets. We see that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 22, probably on a beach. He spoke to a large crowd on the beach in Matthew 13, verse 2. And today's reading also takes place on a beach. So as you know, our reading was from chapter 21 of John's Gospel. And when reading John's Gospel, you might ask, why do we need chapter 21 at all? Why not just take the great ending of chapter 20, where we learn of the resurrection, with Jesus appearing to his disciples, and even Thomas the doubter believing and saying, my Lord and my God. Wouldn't this seem a perfect ending? But if John had finished there and we didn't have chapter 21, we wouldn't understand how Peter went from denying Jesus to having a leading role in the early Christian church that we see in Acts. The last time Jesus saw Peter was just after Jesus was arrested and a servant girl recognized Peter as one of the disciples, which he denied. Luke 22 then goes on to tell us that Peter denied knowing Jesus another twice, fulfilling what Jesus had told him, that he would deny him three times before the cock crowed that day. Peter was so ashamed that he ran away and hid. So if John's gospel ended in chapter 20, the book of Acts wouldn't make any sense. We need chapter 21, where we see Peter being fully restored. In our text, the disciples have gone fishing. Now, seven of them were professional fishermen before Jesus called them to be fishers of men. Being fishers of men was a picture that these men could relate to. They were fishermen, so they knew what that meant. They knew the the commitment and work being a fisherman required. So this morning I want to quickly look at some of the characteristics of being a fisherman, as a lot of the same characteristics that make for a successful fisherman also make for a successful Christian. So in general, fishermen are hardworking. Fishermen throughout time have had to get up early or go out at night and be out in the sea in all weathers. It's a tough trade. And similarly, being a Christian isn't easy. Christians have to live differently from the world. We have to be different, and that can take a lot of hard work. Fishermen are courageous. The sea is a dangerous place, even now, and the Sea of Galilee is no different. It's known for fierce storms that rise up suddenly out of nowhere. And as Christians, it takes courage to stand for the Lord. In some places, You're risking your life if you've professed to being a Christian. But even if we don't face death, it can be hard to stand up for our faith in the face of scorn or ridicule from our peers. Fishermen are patient. Fishermen and anglers must be some of the most patient people in the world, spending all day searching for a catch, or in the case of an angler, sitting all day on the riverbank with a rod and line dangling in the river. Such patience. No, no, I'm only joking. I know there's more to angling than that, but that's what it looks like to me. As Christians working with people, 
we also have to be patient and work with people at their pace. People don't always grow in faith at the rate we would like them to. It takes patience to let God work and to accept people where they are and patiently love them to where they need to be. We need to be patient with other people, patient with God, allowing him to work at his pace, and we need to be patient with ourselves, allowing ourselves space to grow and develop our faith at the pace, at the pace that is right for us with God's guidance. Being patient can be really difficult. We want things to happen when we want them to. Fishermen are cooperative. The disciples used huge nets, and unless they worked together, they had no chance of catching anything. They had to all pull in the same direction, or else everything would rip and come apart, and sadly, they wouldn't catch any fish. Churches have to be the same. If we aren't all pulling in the same direction, we won't achieve anything. Cooperation, working as a team, is key. Now, you try putting a group of men or women in the same fishing boat and get them to agree on a plan. It's not going to happen. They have to have a leader. If you've ever been part of a group trying to make a decision, you know a leader is needed to move things forward. And verse 3 indicates that Peter was that leader, but he needed to be a better leader than he was. And on this day, Jesus would do some work on Peter for his sake and for the sake of many others who would follow him. So in the reading, Peter and the others had fished all night and caught nothing. Then what appeared to be a stranger, a hundred yards away from the boat, called out to them saying, Have you caught anything? No, they answered. He told them to cast their net on the other side of the boat. Now can you imagine these men were professional fishermen. They had been fishing all night, they had caught nothing, They were exhausted and ready to head for home. Then this stranger was telling them how to do their job. But they did it anyway. They trusted, as Erland was saying earlier on, they trusted this man. Their nets, the the nets they pulled up were so full they couldn't haul them back into the boat. And with the load that was in the nets, they should have broken, but they didn't. And John was the one on the boat who recognised this as a miracle, the fact that the nets didn't break with a huge catch and the fact that they had caught so many fish. And he recognised the stranger on the beach as Jesus. But Peter was the one who jumped out of the boat and swam to shore. Now we can only imagine what's going on in Peter's mind when Jesus appeared on the beach, told him where to catch the fish and then sat down and ate with them. He must have been relieved that Jesus was alive, but he couldn't possibly forget how he had denied his friend, teacher and Lord. But Peter was still the one who jumped into the sea and swam to the beach first. Now we get to what I really want to focus on today, the first half of verse 15, which says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, Jesus didn't take Peter away and have a nice, quiet, private conversation. He had this conversation with Peter in front of the other disciples. He did this because what he was saying wasn't just for Peter, but would benefit everyone there, just as it will benefit us. Peter's sin had been public. He had denied Jesus in front of so many people, and so his restoration had to be public as well. Peter sinned publicly, so he had to make it right publicly, but Jesus doesn't condemn Peter, and he doesn't even make the conversation about the details of the sin. He goes straight to the heart of the matter. Jesus is asking Peter to look at his heart, not his head or his feelings, but his heart. Remember, Jesus already knew the answer to the question, so he isn't asking this for his sake, but for Peter's sake. He's giving Peter the opportunity to examine his heart after his denial. Jesus asked three times, do you love me? As with everything else Jesus did, asking the question three times is significant. Peter denied Jesus three times, 
So he had to undo that denial three times. But the question, and for that matter, Peter's answers are also important. Jesus did not ask Peter, do you believe? Saying you believe in God does not automatically mean that you love Jesus. I know many people, and I'm sure you do too, who say they believe in God, but they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus as their saviour, and that is what this is about. Peter had already made a great profession of faith. In Mark chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say I am? And Peter replied, You are the Christ. Now that's good orthodox doctrine. He is a true believer. There are many people who have head knowledge of Jesus, but not heart knowledge. They may know all the facts and details of Jesus' life, but not have a living relationship with him. God sees our heart and wants to get to the heart of the matter. Good doctrine or head knowledge is no substitute for loving God. Now, Jesus didn't ask Peter, have you been baptised? He didn't care if Peter had made a public declaration of his belief by being baptised or standing up in front of a group of people professing his faith. Jesus did not ask Peter, are you a leader? Peter was an apostle, one of the privileged twelve. He was part of the inner circle of three. And he was Jesus' chosen leader among them, the rock on which he would build the church. But none of that mattered. Jesus did not ask Peter, what have you done for me? Peter is the rock. He walked on water. He was a leader. He had a huge list of accomplishments. But all Jesus needed to know was, do you love me? And Peter's answer? Three times he said, you know that I love you. There was no bluster. There was no trying to prove his love by listing everything he had done. By the third time of answering, Peter could have been annoyed and his reply changed, but it didn't. The question laid his heart bare and he replied from the heart each time. Now, I want you to use your imagination. Imagine you are having this conversation with Jesus, not Peter. I'm going to ask you to do something that we don't ask very often during a sermon. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Close your eyes and picture yourself standing face to face with Jesus. Looking him in the eyes and he asks you the question he asked Peter. He isn't asking you, are you a card-carrying Christian? He doesn't want to know if your doctrine is orthodox. He isn't interested in investigating your sins and doesn't condemn you for them. He doesn't want to know if you stood in front of the church declaring your belief or if you've been baptised. Now, a lot of Christian churches expect a believer to be baptised as an adult. It's an outward sign of someone's faith. But that is what it is, a sign to other people. God doesn't care if you've been baptised as an adult, a child, or not at all. He isn't concerned about your position. He doesn't care if you're a church leader, sing in the choir, or play a musical instrument for praise. Because it is possible to be all of these and do all of these and not love God. He doesn't want to know about your achievements or how much you have to give the church. You may not be able to give millions of pounds to the work of the church, but you can love Jesus as much as any human who has ever lived. All he wants to know is, do you love me? Remember when Jesus asked Peter if he loved him, Jesus already knew the answer. The question was for Peter's sake. And so when he asks us, do you love me? He already knows the answer but is giving us the opportunity to examine our hearts. Our hearts, not our heads, or our feelings. If you haven't already done so, you can open your eyes now. What did Jesus tell Peter he wanted him to do when he professed his love? He said in verse 15, feed my lambs. And then in verse 16, take care of my sheep. And in verse 17, 
feed my sheep. Again, this is an analogy the men could relate to. They knew that taking care of sheep was an important job. It meant living alongside them, getting to know them all, and doing whatever it took to keep them safe. This is what Jesus wants us to do as well. There's no better way to bring someone to faith or help them grow in their faith than to live alongside them. Throughout history, we have seen huge religious rallies where people were converted by the amazing preaching of the gospel. People like Billy Graham or Louis Palau and many more have led millions to faith. But the real work only starts at the end of the rally. We can't all be great preachers, but we can get alongside people. Be with them through life's challenges. Take care of them in whatever way they need. This is what Jesus wanted Peter to do and he wants us to do. If we love him, feed his sheep. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the blessings you have given us. We thank you for the son you sent to save us and for the opportunities we have to show your love in the world. Lord, help us to stand tall and tell the world we love you with all our hearts. Lord, help us to feed your sheep. Amen. Now we are going to sing together, All I Know. as we leave this place, help us to be patient, courageous, and cooperative, working together for your sake, showing your love to the world. And as we leave, may the peace of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us this day and forevermore. Amen. Sorry, just before the doxology, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to the AV team and David. We technical hitch, but Thank you, Sandy. You coped with it very well. <laughs> Experienced crew upstairs, so thank you all very much.
good.